So we're reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 6, Chapter 17, Text 8 and 9. So 9 is on the board, so I'll just say 8 and then we'll go to 9. Pryasha prakritas chapi striyam rahasi bibrti ayam mahavrata daro bibarti sarasi striyam. Translation <clears throat> Ordinary conditioned persons generally embrace their wives and enjoy their company in solitary places. How wonderful it is that Lord Mahadev, although a great master of austerity, is embracing his wife openly in the midst of an assembly of great saints. Poor point. The word Mahavrata Dara indicates a brahmachari who has never fallen down. Lord Shiva is counted amongst the best of yogis, yet he embraced his wife in the midst of a great saintly persons. Chitraketu appreciated how great Lord Shiva was to be unaffected even in that situation. Therefore, Chitraketu was not an offender. He merely expressed his wonder. Okay, text nine. Shishuka vacha, Bhagavan apitach trutva, Prahasya gada dir nirpa, Tushnim bhuva sadasi. Sabyas cha ta danu vrata. Sabyas cha ta danu vrata. She apitach trutva. Prahasya gadadir nipa. Tusnim babu vasadasi. Sabyas cha ta danu vrata. Sabyas cha ta Bhagavan apitach trutva. Prahasya gadadir nipa. Tusnim babu vasadasi. Sabyas cha ta dunabrita. Sabyas cha ta dunabrita. Chan? Chan? She suko vacha. pita chutva. Prahas yaga dadir nipa. Sabyas cha dana nutrita. She is a Sabyas 
Shri Shukadeva Goswami said, Bhagavan, Lord Shiva, <clears throat> Api, also, Tat, that, Shutva, hearing, Prahasya, smiling, Agadadadi, whose intelligence is unfathomed. Nripa, O oh King, to snim, silent, Babuva, remained, Sadasi, in the assembly, Sabya, everyone assembled there, Cha, and Tat Anuvrata, followed Lord Shiva and remained silent. Translation. Srila Shukadeva Goswami continued, My dear King, after hearing Chitraketu's statement, Lord Shiva, the most powerful personality, whose knowledge is fathomless, fathomless, simply smiled and remained silent, and all the members of the assembly followed the Lord by not saying anything. Purport by His Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada. Chitraketu's purpose in criticizing Lord Shiva is somewhat mysterious and cannot be understood by a common man. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, however, has made the following observations. Lord Shiva, being the most exalted Vaishnava and one of the most powerful demigods, is able to do anything he desires. Although he was externally exhibiting the behavior of a common man and not following etiquette, such actions cannot diminish his exalted position. The difficulty is that a common man, seeing Lord Shiva's behavior, might follow his example, as stated in Bhagavad Gita. Yadyadacharity sheshtas tatad eva taro janaha sayat prana manam kurute lokas taranuvartate. Whatever action a great man performs, common men follow. And whatever standards he sets by exemplary acts, all the world pursues. A common man might also criticize Lord Shiva, like Daksha, who suffered the consequences for his criticism. King Chutuketu desired that Lord Shiva cease this external behavior so that others might be saved from criticizing him and thus becoming offenders. If one thinks that Vishnu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is the only perfect personality, whereas the demigods, even such demigods as Lord Shiva, are inclined to improper social affairs, he is an offender. Considering all of this, King Chitraketu was somewhat harsh in his behavior with Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva, who is always deep in knowledge, could understand Chitraketu's purpose. Therefore, he was not at all angry. Rather, he simply smiled and remained silent. The members of the assembly surrounding Lord Shiva could also understand Chitraketu's purpose. Consequently, following the behavior of Lord Shiva, they did not protest. Instead, following their master, they remained silent. If the members of the assembly thought that Chitraketu had blasphemed Lord Shiva, they would certainly have left at once, blocking their ears with their hands. Amagyana timirandasya jananjana salakaya chakshun militam yena tasmai shi gurave namaha. So here, uh, Maharaj gave a nice class yesterday about Chitra K2. And I was thinking that we're all in that same position as King Chitra K2. Uh, maybe not as extreme our circumstances. But this going up and down, this feeling pleasure, and then the pleasure going, and up and down. And we're thinking that this pleasure is what we're wanting, not the suffering, right? Everyone's searching for this pleasure. 
But if we consider, I know within my life, if I consider looking back, the times when I'm suffering is when I'm taking the most shelter of Krishna. That's when Krishna becomes a real shelter for me. And I think anyone can see that in their lives, that when you're happy, you can easily forget Krishna. You know, I'm enjoying. We can also become very proud of ourselves, you know. Oh, I'm such a great devotee, or I'm doing so well. Look at Krishna's giving me so much and such a nice position. And, um, and we can forget about Krishna and put ourselves in the center. But when we're experiencing suffering conditions, that's when we're humbled. Krishna is humbling us. And then we can actually truly take shelter, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Um, and we can beg for his shelter, we can beg for his mercy, please. But that mercy comes in all different forms. And for us to think that the mercy is only flying in the airplane with all of these beautiful ladies or, you know, having big position or, you know, if we're thinking that that is what will uh, make us happy and that's actually the mercy of the Lord, we're mistaken. Because the mercy comes in all different ways. And Krishna, as soon as we surrender to him, Lord Chaitanya said, if we just say, my dear Lord Krishna, although I have forgotten you for so many long years in this material world, today I am surrendering unto you. I am your sincere and serious servant. Please engage me in your service. From this day on, I am yours. As soon as we say that, the Lord takes us as his. And then in different ways, he will mold us, just like um, clay. If you have a, a, a hunk of clay, you know, if you mold that clay in different ways, you can make a pot or something useful. So in the same way, we're just like that lump of clay. We're so useless, at least myself. You all are exalted Vaishnavas, but for myself, I'm such a useless person. You know, but if I can just surrender to Krishna and let him mold me in the way that he wants to mold me, then I can serve the Lord in some good capacity. So this molding can be tough sometimes. We can go through circumstances that just seem so difficult. Why I'm in this circumstance is so awful. How can I get out of it? Maybe this, I can do this, or I can... You know, we try to make arrangements to get out of that suffering situation. But actually, if we look at it, that suffering situation is perfectly designed for us to make us move forward in our devotional service. Um, I've had many such circumstances. And it's just, and I can see at the time, it's like being squeezed in a vice. You're going, oh, how can I get out of this? But Krishna is so perfect. He makes it so that you're surrounded. You can't get out. It's kind of like sometimes the other morning at Mangalarti, we're standing there, and I thought, okay, I'll stand in the back in the corner. And, and then so many devotees came in, so many, so many. And then I'm squished, and I'm thinking, how can I get out? <laughs> so we feel like that sometimes. Krishna has us cornered. And he makes such a perfect arrangement that we have to surrender. Maybe it's our false ego that we have to surrender. Because we carry that around with us all the time. I don't know if you've ever noticed. I find as soon as I start to chat chop in the morning, oh, the mind starts going, you know, maybe saying, oh, I'm such a great chanter. Or, Srila Bhakti Sananta Saraswati Thakur said the same thing, you know, oh, here I am, such a great Vaishnava. I'm chanting so nicely, Krishna's hearing this holy name. But we should immediately pick up that stick and start smashing that mind. That is not our friend. That mind is there just trying to get us to think that we are something great when we're actually something so insignificant. We're so insignificant. Here we see Lord Shiva. He's the greatest Vaishnav. And he's sitting there and he's embracing his wife. And Chitraketu is riding in his airplane. And he's seeing some fault. Oh, look, he is embracing his wife in front of all these saintly persons. 
But luckily, Srila Prabhupada, in the poor board, he says how a common man cannot understand this. So immediately our minds might go, oh, look at Lord Shiva embracing this, his wife in front of all. We might find fault. So Prabhupada kindly explains to us that that isn't the purpose. Chittiketu is saying this so that others don't imitate this behavior. And if we see in ourselves, in every situation, there's someone lower than us that is looking to us for some example. So each one of us also has to consider that we're an example for someone else. That our behavior, our words, the things we do, are being seen by others and followed. And due to our, uh, I guess, bad upbringing or mental, we, we try to go for the lowest denominator, right? So if we see something, do, someone doing something that we know maybe we shouldn't do, but that person's doing it, that devotee's doing it, and he's such a good devotee, she's such a good devotee. You know, so each of us has to take on the responsibility that our behavior is being watched, that we must act in an exemplary way, that we're, we're representatives of Srila Prabhupada and this parampara. And if we look back at our parampara, it is so exalted. There's nothing like it. It's so amazing. From Lord Brahma down, Krishna, to Lord Brahma and down through our Sampradaya. So we are representatives of the greatest Sampradaya. We are so fortunate. So how we must behave. And then I thought once pride comes in and maybe we say something that then we start creating offenses, right? Then, then the offensive mentality. For chanting the holy name, the first offense is to blaspheme devotees who have dedicated their lives to the propagation of the holy names of the Lord. So then, so easily we're thinking, I'm such a great devotee. Oh, look at that person. They're doing such and such. Oh, they're so fallen, right? And then immediately that pride is there and then we start finding fault in other devotees. And this is considered the mad elephant offense. And why is that? Okay, we see an elephant. We might have a beautiful garden and a beautiful village and just one mad elephant. I remember seeing once on, um, someone had sent me a, a thing on email and it had a little video of an elephant going crazy in a village. And it was so scary. This elephant came, it was smack, it was pulling people with its trunk and whipping them around and throwing them. It was smashing things with its feet, shaking its head and its tusks were smashing everything. And it was such a frightening thing. And I thought that's like, we're, we have this field of, in our heart that we're growing our bhakti lata in. And as soon as we start creating offenses, it's just like letting that wild elephant into our beautiful garden that we've been trying to cultivate. And it's just going to create havoc and destroy everything that we've been working for. So we have to be so careful not to create offenses against Vaishnavas. And um, I was reading uh, um, in the fourth canto, no, ninth canto, about Durvasa Muni. Ninth Canto, I think, um, and Ambarish Maharaj. And he was such an example of that. You know, he was so proud. He's coming to this king's, and the king's saying, oh, may I serve you? Let me give you all lunch, please, come. He said, no, I'm going to take bath first and say Gayatri Mantra, then I will come back. So we know that Ambarish Maharaj had been fasting, and it was time to break his fast, and still, Durvasamuni hadn't come back. So then um, Dur uh, Ambarish Maharaj was thinking, what should I do? I can't eat before my guests come back, but I must break the fast. So he inquired from the brahmanas, what should I do? They said, drink water. Because drinking water is neither um, eating, but it's breaking the fast. So he drank water. Well, Durvasamuni, 
he understood, oh, the king, he has drunk this water and before me, and he became so proud, thinking, I am a Brahmin, I'm a mystic yogi, and he is just a king, right? So then he went, and he was so angry, he said so many words to Ambarish Maharaj, and then he created a big demon to kill Ambarish Maharaj. But the Lord had had, had Sudarshan. It said in the Bhagavatam that, that because Maharaj Ambarish didn't, he didn't protect himself. He was great at protecting all of his citizens, but for himself, he did not give any protection. So the Lord arranged that Sudarshan would protect him. So immediately Sudarshan went for Dervashamuni. And Dervasamuni was humbled, thinking, whoa, first he killed that demon, and then he went after Dervasamuni. And we know that he went all over the universe seeking shelter. And he could not find shelter anywhere. And then he went to Lord Vishnu. And Lord Vishnu said, this is my devotee. You are thinking that you're such a great mystic yogi that you are a Brahmin, you are above Ambarish Maharaj because he's a king, but you're not understanding. The devotees are my heart. The devotees are my heart. I love them. You cannot, you cannot go and think you are so much better and offend my devotees and think that you can come and take shelter here. And that whole part of the Bhagavatam, Durvasamuni is explaining that you, you cannot offend devotees. The Vaishnava is just like me. I consider the Vaishnava even better than myself. He is more dear to me. Um, one of the verses, he, uh, Durvasa Muni, after extensive talks, Lord Vishnu trying to explain to him, then Durvasa Muni at the end said, today I have experienced the greatness of the devotees. Although I have committed offenses, Ambarish Maharaj has prayed for me. Okay, because once he went back, he took shelter of, of Ambarish Maharaj, and he said, I'm so sorry, because Lord Vishnu had revealed to him, what a fool, what a fool. And we can become in that situation. I know myself, I always, you know, that, that mind, that false ego comes up, thinking that we're so much better than other devotees. Oh, look at me, I, I can do this, or I'm in this position. Oh, look, all the others are out there, but I'm here, right? But that's so wrong. We can never make advancement like that. We can only make offenses in that frame of mind, which is why we beat the mind with the stick, with the broom, with the shoe. Keep the mind down. When it comes up, oh, I am, so no, I'm just a fool. I am a fool. The only qualification I have is my spiritual master. He's the qualification. Other than that, what do I have? So we have to keep that in mind, that we are nobody. We are nothing. Without the Lord's mercy, we have nothing. So um, I was reading Vishwanath Chakrabarti Thakur's um, Shoartha Darshani, and about the Damodar Lila. And he made a, such a wonderful point that I thought I would share with you, that um, when Mother Yashoda was trying to bind Krishna, she kept finding that rope, two fingers too short. And no matter how many ropes she put together, still two fingers too short. And she was thinking, oh, how is this? His little son, he's so small, and yet all these ropes in the village won't go around his waist. How is this? So she's working so hard trying to capture him, and she can't. And Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says, then the Lord saw her effort and her hard work. And he said, then Krishna's heart, it melted like butter. So he, he made the point that just like butter, I know we have cows and we churn butter, and if it's too warm, it's just so soft, it just runs through your fingers. Just, so the Lord's heart becomes just like that for the devotee 
who puts in an endeavor and some hard work. So we have to desire to have Krishna's mercy. And then the Lord's heart becomes like that butter, and he immediately gives mercy to the devotee. And then it says, then the Supreme Lord is easily captured. As soon as the Lord's heart melted like that, then immediately she could tie that rope around her son. So we want to become like this. You know, open to Krishna's desire, whatever he wants. Let me just make some endeavor to make an advancement in Krishna consciousness. Let me hear from others. Let me read Srila Prabhupada's books and understand what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. And also let me hear when bad things happen, when there's situations. Let me look deeper into that. What is Krishna trying to teach me by this? What lesson does he want me to learn so that I can be molded like that clay into something useful? You know, a lump of clay, it can't carry water, it can't do anything. But as soon as it's made into a pot, it's so useful. So let me become like that. Let Krishna mold me however. Let me just learn this lesson that you are trying to teach me. We tend to try to make some other, or blame someone. Maharaj was speaking about that yesterday. You know, oh, I'm in this situation, it's because so-and-so did this, and so-and-so did that, and they made this, and that blew what I was trying to do, right? We're thinking like that. We're not, we're not thinking, oh, maybe Krishna wants to teach me something here. But as soon as we think like that, then we'll understand what it is. I had one, um, one time, I had just moved to a, a temple, and when you move, nobody knows you, right? You're just someone different coming along. And so uh, I'm standing, it's Radhastami, and I'm standing at the back, and I'm praying to Shimati Radharani, oh, please give me your blessings. And, and then I thought of my son. He was a bit naughty, and he was off doing who knows what. And I was thinking, oh, Shimati Radharani, I wish that you would bring him here, that he could take up Krishna consciousness more sincerely. And then straight away, someone, are you the mother of so-and-so? And I said, yes. They said, oh, the police have your son out in front of the temple. <laughs> Oh no! And all these devotees are seeing this. And then I thought, well, Shimati Radharani brought him to the temple. <laughs> but how embarrassing! And I'm thinking, oh, and I, I'm new and they don't know me, and now they're going to think I'm so bad. And, you know, I'm thinking like that. But then later I'm seeing, you know, this is Krishna. This is the way he can humble me. My pride is so big. But he is forcing this situation that you have to become humble. Trinadapi suniche na tororapi sahishni na amani na manade na kirtaniya sarahari. Without that humility, we cannot chant the holy names of the Lord. With pride, why is Krishna attracted to that? It's with humility that Krishna is attracted to our chanting. So if it takes the police bringing your son in front of all the devotees on Rod asked me, <laughs> then that's what it takes. Then, okay, I will take that. I will accept that. If that's what it takes to humble me. You know, Krishna makes so many different arrangements. And if that's what it takes, then that is blessings. That is real mercy from the Lord. Not that I'm given a position to speak Bhagavatam and I'm thinking I'm so great or, you know, that is also mercy. But if it makes my false ego go so big and my head so heavy that I can't even pick it up off the pillow the next morning, what use is that? So we should accept everything the Lord sends to us, whether it's good, whether it's bad, whether it's uncomfortable, whether it's comfortable, we just accept that as Krishna's mercy. One time Srila Prabhupada was discussing about um, 
how Krishna gave him that mercy by taking everything away. And he was saying, the devotees kind of started laughing. He was saying, oh, Krishna took everything from me. My business collapsed. And, and the devotees were kind of laughing. And Prabhupada said, no, this was painful. It's not that it's not going to be painful. <laughs> it's hard work. Hard work is painful. But in the end, it's nectar. Because then you become something worthy. The prophet said, no, this was painful. But it was the Lord's mercy on him. And the Lord is ready always. In the one um, lecture that Prabhupada talked about, Ajamil, and he was discussing how Ajamil, he had become so fallen that the Brahmin community would not, they would not even see his face. He had become so fallen. But in the end, Krishna gave him, okay, you name your son Narayan. And in the end, he remembered Narayan. And he was saved from such a bad situation. And then Prabhupada said, do not think that Krishna is an ungrateful master. Do not think that. You know, we might think, oh, well, Krishna will be kind to this devotee because he's such a pure devotee, but not to me. But Krishna is kind to all of his devotees. He says, he is, they are my heart. Okay, so your heart is, is where all your feeling is. You don't let things into your heart that aren't nice, right? So Krishna is taking all the devotees into his heart. They are his heart. So they are special, very special. So we should never think that Krishna doesn't care about my service. He doesn't care about me. He doesn't even notice me. Because he does. He cares about every single one of us. I saw some names um, of Krishna that I thought I would share with you that's along this line. Um, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur had mentioned these, so I thought I would mention them. Um, Bhakta Pradina, one controlled by the devotees. Sadhu Maya, dependent upon his devotees. Sadhu Grasta, Manas, whose mind is wrapped in thoughts of his devotees. Sadhu Priya, one who loves his devotees as they love him. Sadhu Dana, who is charitable to his devotees. Sadhu Chari, who always resides amongst his devotees. And Sadhu Chitta, in whose heart his devotees reside. So these are such sweet names of Krishna, just showing how wonderful he is and how kind he is to his devotees. You know, how, how much he loves his devotees. So therefore we should always take heed not to offend a devotee. No matter what. You know, Lord Shiva here, what does he do? He remains silent. And all of his disciples and, and devotees there, they also remain silent. So we may be in positions where someone might say something that's maybe painful, but we just remain silent, you know, and see, maybe there's something I can learn from this. You know, maybe there's something I can learn. Maybe they're saying something, maybe very harshly. It said, Chitraketu, it was considered very harsh what he said. You know, here he is flying over and then he's criticizing, he's pointing out a defect in Lord Shiva where there is no defect. So, you know, and doc, like Daksha Prabhupada mentioned him in the poor port, you know, he immediately starts blaspheming. Ah, oh, he's covered in ashes. He's always at the crematoriums. His friends are ghosts and buddhas. So many horrible things he's saying. And of course, immediately, Lord Shiva's attendants became so angry. This is it. Chop off his head and get rid of him. You know, no more. We're not hearing this anymore. Right? But Chitra Ketu, they all were just silent. Because they could understand, they were advanced devotees. They could understand the real intent. You know, the intent was not just to blaspheme Lord Shiva. The intent was to show that others should not behave like this. You know, 
One time here in Mayapur, Srila Prabhupada was looking out of his windows and he saw a grihasta couple sitting together on a bench. And he said, go down and tell them they should not do that in public. They should not sit there close like that in public. So our behavior, Lord Shiva, he's sitting embracing his wife on his lap. But all of our behaviors have to be, they're seen by everyone. We have to be impeccable. What, what is that? Um, Caesar's wife should be above suspicion. Prabhupada used that a few times. That you know we have to be above suspicion. We ha and we have to act properly. And if somehow we do something maybe not so good, and someone says to us, Prabhu, um, maybe you should not behave like that, or you know, we shouldn't immediately go. How dare you say that? You know, Lord Shiva could have said that to Chittakai, and in fact, his wife did say that to Chittakai too. But we should take the humble position. Oh, thank you, Prabhu. I will take that into consideration. You know, maybe sometimes it doesn't exactly fit, but there, you know, that's a humbling thing. But we should, we should be open to how the Lord instructs us through devotees, through so many different things, situations. So I'll stop there, and if there's any questions or comments, or please. I think there's a... Go right there. You're saying how we have to always represent Shri Prabhupada by repeating his teachings, that what he says is what we, what we do, you know, as his kind devotees. And the other day I was out at the book table in front of the temple and I was admiring this book called Mothers or Masters that was all, that on the bottom it said this is all based on the teachings of A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami so Prabhupada Bhaktivedanta Swami Bhaktivedanta Swami's book yeah. and just as I was admiring it uh, Amataji came along and, and saw that and said you know this book should be thrown in the trash it's uh, an insult to all the Daiki Davies that have positions of leadership throughout ISKCON. It's, uh, it's an insult to women, and I felt like a little stunned, you know, because I was just thinking that, well, it's based on Prabhupada's teachings, it's, it's just all good. And we know that as an American, as I, we, a hundred years ago, all the men were being slaughtered in Europe with World War I. So women had to be, but an industrial society brought women into the workplace. Mm -hmm. And by the time we got to the end of the 70s, any woman who was brought up in the West is taught from a very small age that to be a humble, sub submissive, chaste wife, servant of a husband, a, a stay-home mom, is, is a complete loser. That's, that they've totally a total failure in that. Mm -hmm. The only way to be successful in life is to get educated, have a good career, and thus become like like soldiers. There's a lot of, now there's a lot of push for women to become uh, soldiers on the battlefield. And, but Prabhupada also said that women, uh, independence for a woman is a hellish life, that, it's, uh, that no woman could be happy without a good man taking care of her. So, in representing Srila Prabhupada and trying to, as a woman, I'm asking you because I know that if, if I asked any man, then the, the ladies would think that, would think, well, it's, you know, it's tinted with a man's slant on things, but as a Mataji, how would you say how women could be masters or mothers from Prabhupada's teachings? Well, I haven't read the book myself, but I know Bhaktivedanta Swami quite well. Um, I knew him when he joined the temple in England. And, um, but we're taking shelter of our spiritual master because there's very there's a lot of matajis that have no husbands or are renounced you know they their husbands have left and they maybe they don't have children so they're having so they take shelter in Srila Prabhupada and I think it's true for society like myself I have five children and I have a husband that I've been married to for many years almost 40 years I guess. And um, we have always preached together and, and 
done things, and I do stay at home a lot, and I cook, and we have cows, so I help milk cows and take care of all the milk and like that. Um, but I also give class sometimes, and I go and do programs at different devotees' homes and preach, and I, and I feel Prabhupada encouraged us to do like that, that we have intelligence. Um, we've been listening to Srimad Bhagavatam classes for so many years, we've been studying Prabhupada's books, and we have some message that we can share for others. Um, and in this day and age, because it is so corrupted just through society, that sometimes women do have to go out and work or do have to, you know, we aren't perfect. We're looking for perfection. Um, materially speaking, we aren't perfect now. We're Kali Yuga specimens, a lot of us. And, you know, if the husbands were perfectly taking care of their wives, then the wives wouldn't have to go out and, and try to get jobs. I, I know of some, some God sisters that were doing devotional service their whole lives and never worked or anything, and then husbands left and went off with someone younger, and then they're left trying to maintain their children by themselves and having to get jobs. and So it's easy to say um, this is the way it should be and this is perfect how it should be, but it's harder to actually perform it like that unless husband and wife are serious um, and the women do feel shelter that they can live at home and take care of the household and take care of their children and that's perfect because then the children feel happy and loved and they can go on to be productive members of society and devotional service but it's not always cut and dry like that and I can't really comment about the book itself because I never read it so I don't know but Lakshmi for what? Hare Krishna. There are many things that are in Prabhupada's books. And so in general, um, when we study Bhakti Shastri, Bhakti Vaibhav, etc., there are different principles of Shastric study, which we use as a barometer when we read. And one of them, or two of them, that are applicable, one is academic integrity, and the other is understanding Prabhupada's mood and mission. And it's not just a matter of counting quotes, because we, we can have a book which is completely based on quotes, and we have many of them. There's one on education, there's one on Varnashram, there's Bhakti Vakash Maharaj's book, and then there's other books that are also based on quotes. Um, Komteya Prabhu put out one in relation to women becoming Diksha Gurus. It's all quotes from Prabhupada. So, if we don't look at it in a balanced way and have academic integrity and try to understand Prabhupada's actual mood and mission, then even when we look at the scripture, we'll get an unbalanced um, perspective because it's not really either or. If you listen to Shutakirati Prabhu um, and, and he, as he explains his experiences with Srila Prabhupada, and my own personal experiences with Srila Prabhupada and those of many other women like Jamuna, Malati, so many other wonderful devotees who had so much association with Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada um, encouraged us in whatever devotional service we wanted to do and he took the role of our father because in a, in a regular Vedic system, a, a woman or a man for that matter, they have parents who are encouraging and who are sheltering um, and that may be the case in, in many areas, but um, when we came to the Hare Krishna movement, that wasn't the case. Our parents were anything but supportive, and um, they were actually kidnapping us and brainwashing us in some cases, or accusing us of being brainwashed. And, and Srila Prabhupada became our father in many, many ways, uh, and he's the father of many devotees even now. Everybody's Shiksha Guru. Um, and if you look at Prabhupada's books in their entirety, you see it's not black and white. It's not this or that. The, the, the cover of the book, Mothers or 
What is it? Mothers or masters. But you don't have to be a mother. You can be a mother and a master, master of something, right? Um, women are powerful. Prabhupada said he made a statement to shoot the Kirti Prabhu that um, the reason he succeeded where his godbrothers failed is because he accepted women into the Hare Krishna movement. They were his secret weapon. And he encouraged us to preach. He encouraged us to distribute books. Mayapur, in many ways, was supported and built by the book distribution of tons of ladies all over America. Men also, but women made tremendous contributions. And all our contributions were sent here on Prabhupada's request to build Mayapur. So as much as we should be those things, we should be good mothers, we should be good um, you know, servants of our husbands, if we have husbands that are worthy of being served. Um, then, and, and at the same time, we should also be good devotees and whatever circumstances we find ourselves in, we should use that facility to the max to spread Krishna consciousness and to help Srila Prabhupada's mission. That's, that's our service. So I think it's a, it's a misnomer to think this or that. Mm. And it's also a misnomer to think these are Prabhupada's quotes because they are Prabhupada's quotes, but there are many other quotes too, and they're not there. So if you want to study deeply Srila Prabhupada's books and understand his letters and his conversations and his behavior and understand Prabhupada's mood and mission, then you'll get a more holistic picture and a deeper understanding. Thank you. Well, one thing I was thinking that, you know, if we latch on to any one thing and think this is it, we're giving this our all in all, it, we can become very offensive to others. You know, if we become fanatical about one aspect of anything, you know, we can become just so offensive. So we have to be very careful to, like Mataji said, round off how we understand things and not just cut off. I remember the first time I ever gave class was in um, South Africa and uh, no woman had ever given class there. And all the men were out on this marathon. So there was a Bhakta giving class and he didn't even know anything about anything. He'd only been there about a week. And then I thought, I could give class better than this. I've been a devotee for 20 years. You know, so, so I sat down and gave, and then immediately I heard, oh, she's like a prostitute. Look at her getting up there, giving class. You know, so many bad things. And I thought, I, I felt like Prabhupada had encouraged me. Just to, why should we sit and not hear from someone who knows a little bit more? You know, so Prabhupada did say, you know, the women could give class. They can give. They can enliven others in Krishna consciousness. So. You know, there's, it's true, it's not one way or another. So we have to be balanced in our thought, in our words, in our actions. Then, then we can make nice advance with Krishna consciousness. Yes? I bought the book by Bhaktivikash Maharaj, and indeed it presents a very concise and clear picture of Vedic culture and the dharma of women. But uh, what was not very clear to me in that book um, is the duties of men as husbands and protectors because there are also many quotes of Srila Prabhupada about this and also I couldn't understand um, how men are to be held responsible to fulfill their duties who does this because as you said it happens many times that men do not fulfill their dharma properly so this is what uh, left me kind of dissatisfied with that book. Mm. Thank you. Sorry, I'm not looking over here very much. I think someone wants to. It's gone beyond. <laughs> um, hi, Krishna. I just wanted to say that back in Prabhupada's day, we just did our service. I don't think anybody, no, I don't think, I know. We didn't get married and the husbands suddenly think, okay, you're mine. Now you come and you serve me and no more service. That never entered anybody's consciousness. I mean, I don't know anybody, any woman, any man, 
who thought, my wife is going to come and, and now take care of me and give up all her service in the temple. In fact, that was considered Maya, wasn't it? Hmm. We, we never skipped a beat. You got married and you got up, and you got up from the fire yoga and went in the kitchen and cooked for the deities. Yeah. You went and dressed the deity. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, cooked your, <laughs> yeah, you cooked your own feast. So at no point in Prophet's Day did we, did we think like that, that we're going to now surrender to our husbands and, and only serve him. Mm -hmm. and, not, and not only that, but our husbands didn't think that. No. They didn't think, okay, I'm marrying this woman, she's mine. <clears throat> we were all expected to continue to serve Srila Prabhupada. Yeah, and the I mission. think that's what Prabhupada was, he never expected us to give up our service. In fact, he was kind of emphatic that we continued to serve, serve the movement. Actually, there was a, a story, Gorky Shordas, Babaji Maharaj. Um, one newly married couple approached him, and they, and, uh, the husband said, so now can, I, can we have some instruction? You know? And so um, he said, yes, when it's prasadam time, you serve your wife prasadam first and she should eat. <laughs> and he was like, what? <laughs> what is he telling me? But he said, no, you should see your wife as the servant of the Supreme Lord, as one of the Lord's servants, not that I'm the master. So that's for all of us. Whatever position we're in, we're the servants. Um, the Bajari on the altar, he is the servant of all of the devotees coming there to take shelter of the Lord. He, that is his service for the Lord, is to serve these devotees. You know, the temple president, his service is to make sure everyone in the temple can engage in some service to serve the Lord. Same with the GBC. E everyone is servant of the servant. Lord Chaitanya said, um, Bhartu Padakamalaya Dasa Dasa Anudasa. That is a safe position. That was another thing that um, uh, Lord Vishnu said to Durvasa Muni, that even, I love my devotees, but even the servants of the servants of my devotees are very dear to me. So that is a safe position, and I'm just the servant of the servant of the servant of the servant of the Lord. Okay. Yes, Prama? I think I got it. You're saying that um, is it possible for a spiritual master to offend his disciples by acting roughly with them or treating them harshly or is that what you, and other superiors that are above you? I think to be on the safe side, we always have to take the humble position and even then think there's some reason why this is happening. Maybe I have some pride lurking there that I'm not seeing, but that this person is seeing in me. Because unless the spiritual master has fallen, um, I think we have to be careful. But you can also go to other devotees, you know, and, and ask them in confidence, what do you think? This is happening to me. And, I don't understand why, and I don't know why this person is behaving like this with me, but could you maybe enlighten me? You know, they might see something that we don't see, you know. Even I was thinking there was a time when um, there was something going on in my temple, and it was alarming to me. And so I thought, what can I do about this? What? You know, this isn't right. I know this isn't right, but what can I do? So I thought, okay, 
the first, I'm going to get a copy of this lecture that was going on, and the first GBC man that comes, I'm going to give them the copy and, and ask, is this right or not? What? And, uh, and then I just let it go. You know, rather than getting on a crusade trying to pull this person down or trying to, and I saw Krishna took perfect care of it. Because the person I approached said, oh, how can you be so proud to think that you know more than so-and-so Maharaj? You know, he just, you know, oh, you just, why are you complaining? Or, you know, you're just insignificant. So then I thought, okay, Krishna has some other arrangement, you know, by this. And it was true. He made it into such a situation that it did so many things at one time, you know. And, but if I went on a crusade about it and started telling this one about it and that one about it, and, then I would start creating offenses. So when we're in a difficult situation, and sometimes there are situations that should be rectified, we should approach another devotee that you know could help the situation, not just for gossip's sake, but actually to, to get advice what you can do to change the situation or is that okay? I'm doing this, this is right, that is right, but he is doing something wrong. So how to uh, understand this? And in many times, like when, when there's nothing is involved, but like uh, you're cornered, like you know, uh, like you said, use example, you're cornered. And your face, uh, nobody is responsible for that situation, but somehow Krishna is cornering you and like trying to humble you. So you think of different kind of options that how you can get out of it or like, so, should we try different options or just let it let let it pass by time or, or what option? Because you may choose the wrong option and it, it may land you in different uh, more trouble. I th I think if you try the options, you're going to get the test again. <laughs> you know, sometimes we could make arrangements to get out of it now, but it'll come again in a way that you're not going to get out of it that way. So you might as well surrender the first time around. It saves a lot of trouble later for Krishna and for us. You know, just, okay, you know, I understand. This is my big false ego, and thank you, Krishna, for cutting it. You know, I, I think this life is so short, and it's so insignificant, really. But we have the human body, which is significant, that we can actually get out of this material world, and that's such a blessing. You know, so, you know, it behooves us to take this opportunity to let ourselves be humbled when needed. You know, just, okay, Krishna, I'm yours. If this is what you want, then I will accept that. How do you understand what you want? Think deeply about it. And it might take a while before you see, oh, that's what he was doing. You know, because sometimes certain situations are so intense that you can't think of anything else. There's no peace. Your mind is just like ah, screaming, right? But then later, when the dust settles, then you can think back and go, oh, that's what Krishna was doing. Now I understand why he has done that. So many situations, I, even just here coming to Mayapur, I guess about... The first time I came to Mayapur was probably, I don't know, maybe 30 years ago or something. And we were put in the long building, right? And they had just built this conch building. And I went into the bathrooms and all, and people had been passing in the showers. And I just like, ah, I can't live like this. And no screens on the windows, so all the mosquitoes were just taking up more space than we could take up. And I just, I flipped out. I can't live like this. I can't do this. So then we found a nicer situation, right? So this time coming, I was trying to make so many arrangements and nothing going right. 
So then I thought, okay, Krishna, Lord Chaitanya, I am your guest here, whatever you want to make arrangements. So this time we did get our own bathroom, but no screens on the windows, the mosquitoes are all coming in and so many things. But I was thinking, thank you, now I can take that test and pass it. I can be here, you know, just thin mat to sleep on, you know, and normally you're used to luxury or, so now I can feel so happy about that. You know, so Krishna gave me that test again. You really want to be here? Can you perform maybe this austerity to be here? Yes, I, I can do that now. Before, no way, no way, I can't do like. But now, yes, thank you, Krishna. Thank you, Lord Chaitanya, for letting me come here and be with your devotees and be in your association. So we have to see, it, we'll get that test no matter what. If we keep on our path of devotional service, We'll keep getting the same test until we pass, so. Okay, it's getting late. I better let everybody go. Jai Srila Prabhupada, ki jai. Srimad Bhagavatam, ki jai.